So this is the third and indeed the final upload of the day. I know most of you are like, oh no, give us some more. We want to learn the whole syllabus. That's not possible for one day. I think it's enough for one day. Anyways, grab a piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at stomas. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, hit the bell notification icon. Then what are you waiting for? Go ahead and do that. Drop a like as you're on it. Drop a comment and share the link to the channel as we are on a journey to 6,000 subscribers. And let's go. So here's our warm-up question. Write short notes on colostomy as an essay. Short notes on colostomy. So what exactly is a stoma? So remember that this is defined as an iatrogenic. Iatrogenic meaning is caused by the physician or the doctor or the surgeon. So this is an iatrogenic holo, which is empty, mucoc mucocutaneous fistula. Remember fistula is an, uh, is an abnormal, con is a connection between two epithelial surfaces. Well as the sinus is a connection between one epithelial sinus and one epithelial surface and the other one is like a blind end. So this is an iatrogenic holomucocutaneous fistula which can either be used for enterofeeding, drainage or diverting feces or flatus. That's the definition of a stoma. So the different types of stomas and they can actually be classified as either the ones that are temporal versus the ones that are permanent. The temporal ones could be input stomas which are used to exactly to put contents into the GIT and output stomas which are used as um, sources of output matter from the GIT. So the input stomas include gastrostomy, jejunostomy, then the output stomas are pharyngostomies, esophagostomy, cecostomy, ileostomy, and colostomy. Then the permanent ones are usually the end ileostomy and the end colostomies. And here are the different relevant sites on the abdomen. So if you see it in this region here, this is most likely a percutaneous endoscopic gastroscopy. If you see it in this region, this may be a transverse loop colostomy. If it's on this side, it's an ileoconduit. It could either be an ileostomy in this area here, a mucus um, fistula here, and also an end colostomy here. So the temporal colostomies are pretty much a gastrostomy, which is the opening between the skin and the stomach. So indicated in patients that actually uh, are feeding, for example, those that have upper GI surgery or upper GI obstruction, which may be caused, for example, someone wanted to kill themselves and they swallowed this caustic, uh, acid, a caustic substance, like for example, sodium hydroxide, which can cause strictures of the esophagus. So before the surgery or to feed the person post-surgery, you can put a gastrostomy. It's not indicated for advanced uh, carcinoma of the esophagus and it may be done as an open procedure or it may be done endoscopically. Then you may also have a jejunostomy which is an opening between the jejunum and the skin. So this is indicated for surgery of the upper GI, especially the stomach. And then of course this is to allow of course the surgical stomach or the surgical wound that is created on the stomach to heal and also it facilitates enterofeeding. So remember a small feeding tube is going to be inserted to allow the feeds to pass through and the feeds need to be specialized so you can't feed them the food that's supposed to be taken by the mouth because remember there are processes that are happening in the mouth and processes that happen in the stomach so you have to buy special type of feed which is needed for the jejunostomy. Then you may have a pharyngostomy which is used to divert solids or saliva to protect the bronchial tree for example in neonates with esophageal atresia or tracheoesophageal fistulas this may be used as a stage operation for example in esophageal replacement surgery it also involves um, diverting the pharynx to the skin and of course uh, technically difficult operation because of the structures which we find in the neck you may have an esophagostomy which is used to divert solids and saliva to protect the bronchial tree, for example, in neonates with esophageal atresia and tracheoesophageal fistulas. This one here can be also used as a stage operation in esophageal replacement surgery. And it usually involves diverting the middle esophagus to the skin. And of course, care is taken to not damage the structures in the neck, which are the nerves and the vessels. Then you may have a cecostomy, which is a stoma between the skin and the cecum. So this one is often used for decompressive purposes following surgeries of the colon, especially those that 
involve anastomosis of the large bowel where the integrity is not really guaranteed or you're not so sure that your anastomosis will hold. You may have an ileostomy, which is the diversion at the level of the ileum. So here it's effluent. There's a lot of content that's coming out here. Most of it is going to be fluid. It's going to be water and electrolytes because remember most of the absorption is happening in the small intestine. Then of course these are referred to as high output stomas and they may actually cause electrolyte imbalances because as I told you, most of the absorption is happening in the st small stomach. And this may actually complicate to skin excoriations. Should be able to identify the differences between an ileostomy and a colostomy. And remember this may also complicate to gallstones for some reason. Then of course, the temporary output stomas may include a colostomy as well, which is this mucocutaneous opening between the colon and the skin. This can either be temporal or permanent. Then remember that the temporal stomas are usually done in conditions where there is diversion, which is required so that the distal part can actually heal. For example, the distal rectum can heal or the distal colon can, can heal in, in, in terms of a colostomy, which is temporal. Then of course, it's going to be closed after the purpose has already been served. You can reverse it. You know, the patient has to go for surgery again. And usually the site of a temporal colostomy is going to be in the right hypochondrium or the left iliac fossa. So the site's either in the right hypochondrium here or the left iliac fossa over there. That's the sites of the colostomy. Then the temporal colostomies can either be a loop colostomy, which is usually done on the transverse colon, a divine double barrel colostomy, where there's a gap in between the two openings on the skin. So this prevents the spillage into the loop. You may have a spectacle and as well as a Hartman type of colostomy. And the permanent colostomies, these are usually end colostomies, which are placed in the left iliac fossa, about six centimeters above and six centimeters medial to the anterior superior iliac spine. Indications of end colostomies include congenital uh, malformations, such as congenital megacolon, anorectal malformations, imperforate anus, Hirschsprung's disease, anal atresia, anorectal genesis, and an anal stenosis. Acquired indications include intestinal obstruction, such as with the sigmoid volvulus, ischemic bowel disease, or gangrenous bowel due to strangulation, penetrating trauma to the bowel, which is happening on the left side, tumors of the anal canal and even the rectum, perforation of the left side of the uh, colon, it can even be in gunshot wounds, high anal fistulas, and even after Hartman's operation. Complications. Remember that complications can be divided into specific to the procedure versus those that are general for any surgical procedure. And they're also divided as immediate, those that are within the first 24 hours, early, within the first month, some people say within the first week, then late, those that are later than the first week. So specific complica complications, which are often specific to the procedure, are things like ischemic gangrene, hemorrhage, the stoma can retract, it can prolapse, or they can be intersusception, they can be parastomohenia, where some of the bowel penetrates through the side of the opening of the stoma. Then you may also have stenosis, which can lead to constipation and even skin excoriation. General complications, which are often related to the or related to the underlying disease, could, could be stoma diarrhea. Remember that water and electrolyte imbalances are going to be there. Hypokalemia is the one of the most common electrolyte imbalance and the most important consequence. You may also have metabolic acidosis because you lose a lot of bicarbonate. You may have nutritional disorders because the gut is not able to absorb the essential nutrients as it is. You may have stones, gallstones and renal stones. Uh, this is actually increased in frequency with those that have ileostomies. You may have psychosexual uh, decline because of this may lead to impotence in men. It may cause loss of libido. And of course, you may have residual disease such as Crohn's and even parastomal fistulas. Here's a difference between ileostomy and colostomy, which is what may be asked of you in the exam. So ileostomy are usually found in the right iliac fossa. Colostomies are found in the left iliac fossa. Ileostomies are often sprout and the contents are corrosive and they tend to damage the local skin. So usually when we bring out um, ileostomy, we bring it out like a flower so that the, you have some of the bowel actually covering the normal skin to prevent these excoriations. While it's with the colostomy, the, 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 the colostomy is flush with skin. Then the contents of ileostomy are usually watery, so small bowel contents, and then with the colostomy, they're usually feculent. And examples of a permanent stoma include a post um, pan procto colectomy, sorry, that's a mouth word of a word, a pan proctocolectomy where we remove like um, the anal canal and all those structures there, then we leave behind an ileostomy, an, an 
and ileostomy. Then with the colostomy, it's after abdominal per, uh, peroneal resection of the rectum. So this is the end colostomy. And then examples of loop temporal stoma resection, for example, in ileostomy over the low anastomosis of an anterior abdomen. And then if the colostomy, it could be in a Hartman's procedure. Then there is some preoperative preparation that needs to be done. So psychosocial and physical preparation needs to be done for all patients that are actually going for theater. Explanation of the indications and the complications of the stoma and of the procedure. Then of course you should mark the site with the patient standing up uh, and so that the patient is able to see the stoma. So it should be five centimeters away from the umbilicus. It should be away from any scars or any skin creases. It should be away from any bony points and the site should be easily accessible for the patient because the patient needs to be able to know how to check the site, check if there's any problem with the site, be able to change the back. And of course, the stoma must be within the rectus sheath. Then what are the principles of sitting a stoma? So remember that it should be seated um, or sited preoperatively, ideally, where the stoma is going to be, and it should be in the most favorable position for the patient. So away from any bony prominences, and it should be in a position where the patient is able to change the bag. And an end colostomy is usually sited in the left iliac fossa. A transverse loop colostomy is usually in the upper quadrants of the abdomen. And then bowel uh, mucus is usually flush with skin in the colostomy, while in the ileostomy it usually has a sprout. So you bring out some of the bowel so that it covers the skin in the ileostomy, while in the colostomies it may almost be at the level of the skin because with the ileostomy the products or the contents are rather corrosive to the skin, but colostomy is rather feculent and not really much of a big problem. So how do we examine a stoma? So remember with any examination, we greet our patient, we explain the examination and we gain consent. We expose the patient. So remember, you're going to first start off with your inspection. So do not start at the hands unless the examiner actually tells you that start with the general examination. So go directly to inspect the abdomen. So you comment to see that you see a stoma, you comment in its location, whether it's in the epigastric region, the right iliac fossa or the left iliac fossa, because this will give you a hint of what type of stoma it is. Is it covered with a bag? If it is covered with a stoma bag, what is in the bag? Is it fecal material? Is it formed stew? Is it semi-formed? Is it liquid? Is it watery or is it even urine? Is it covered? Is the stoma covered by a bag? Then examine the mucus lining. Does it look healthy or unhealthy? Is it a sprout or it's flush with the skin? Does it have one opening, which is usually an end, or it's a loop where there's an afferent and an efferent portion of bowel with a common opening or two separate openings? Then, of course, comment on the rest of the abdomen for any scars, uh, midline transverse incisions, any wood dehiscence or masses that you can see, or any other drains or any other healed scars or any other stomal scars that you may see on the abdomen. Then, of course, if you have inspected, you only need to inspect. In the setting of an exam, you only need to inspect. Then if you're only asked to inspect, only do that. But if you're asked to examine the patient fully, then you also have to palpate. Then if then you, you haven't been asked to palpate, do not palpate. Then of course, then when you touch the patient, then there should be a good reason why um, you should not really disturb the bag. So when you're examining and you're palpating, please do not disturb the bag. Even if it's to move the stomach bag out of the way, there's a good reason why you shouldn't touch the bag. Then when you complete your examination, you should tell your examiner that you would have loved to do the rest of the abdominal examination to look for other reasons or other things that may indicate why this patient actually had the stoma in the first place. Then you cover the patient up and of course you'll be doing this as you're having a running commentary. Then of course, rehabilitation of the patient following the placement of the stoma. Remember the diet should be normal. The back should be changed at least once or twice. But remember, this is very difficult because the bags sometimes are expensive. And this needs to be emptied more and more frequently if it's urine or if it's a fluid uh, fecal matter. And of course, the ileostomy should have the base plate uh, under the bag and this should be changed every five days and the back should be changed daily. There should also be some psychological and psychosexual support for this patient. Coming back to our warm-up essay, write short notes on colostomy. So remember that this is a holoiatrogenic mucocutaneous fistula between the colon and the skin. The types include temporal, which is done in conditions where there is diversion that is required to facilitate healing of the distal part of the rectum or the distal colon. 
that this type is closed once the purpose is done and the site is usually in the right hypochondrium or the left iliac fossa. Examples include the loop colostomy, divine double barrel colostomy, spectacle, and Hartman. Then you may have a permanent type of colostomy, which is usually an end colostomy, placed in the left iliac fossa, six centimeters above and medial to the anterior superior iliac spine. Indications can be congenital, including things like megacolon, anorectal malformations, imperforate anus, Hirschsprung's disease, anal atresia, anorectogenesis and anal stenosis or acquired, things like intestinal obstruction caused by sigmoid volvulus, ischemic bowel disease, tumors of the anal or rectal um, areas, perforation of the left side of the colon, high anal fistulas, and even after a Hartman's operation. Complications of a colostomy include ischemic gangrene, hemorrhage, retraction, prolapse, and parastomal hernias. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, consider subscribing to the channel. Hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such amazing content every time I post. That's all for today. Until the next time, to Zambia and beyond, my name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time, bye-bye.